Good evening, Brattleboro and Southern Vermont and all of our local stations that, uh, t you know, tie in with us with this viewing and watch. Marijuana Resolve uh, with Daryl Pillsbury and Vita Crucetta. Daryl today is in the control booth uh, taking on a different role that he'd like to add to his already considerable role of helping to bring good entertainment and shows to, uh, to our viewers at BCTV here at the BCTV studios in Brattleboro, Vermont. Today is uh, February, uh, February, is uh, April 18th um, at, uh, at here in Brattleboro. We have uh, back with us today uh, Eric Lineback, who, who is the treasurer of Vote Hemp, and he's here today to talk about the, uh, the upcoming uh, Hemp History Week in May, and we're going to uh, give you folks some information about it, um, what you can do to be a part of it, and reasons why we think this is, we should be, it'll be an exciting week for you to get involved. And I'd like to begin by introducing you to Eric. And Eric, I think what you could help us start with is give us some background about the um, the, the, the genesis. Uh, what made uh, what what prompted Vote Hemp, which might be an obvious question, to to begin the National uh, um, uh, um, Hemp History Week that, that that you folks now do. Well, thanks for having me back. First of all, it's well. great to be back. Uh, enjoy your show, and uh, welcome back to the viewers. Um, yeah, I guess I guess I could just quickly uh, remind people what Vote Hemp is all about uh, first, and and then it'll be easy to explain why Hemp History Week is is something we're we're uh, engaging in here. Uh, Vote Hemp was founded uh, in 2000 to basically promote industrial hemp and to work towards getting the laws changed so that we can once again grow uh, the crop in this country. Um, we've made slow but steady progress over the years. Uh, recently celebrated, uh, obviously, our 10th anniversary, and uh, I think we joked about this on the show last time that it's not something we thought we would, you know, celebrate or looked forward to celebrating because we were hoping it wouldn't take this long. Um, but here we are, and uh, slow progress. Um, but what what Boat Hemp is about again is educating both uh, you, the voters, uh, you, the consumers, uh, and legislators uh, and politicians on this issue. Um, we're not able to grow hemp in this country. We are able to import the products, the finished goods, the raw materials. Uh, however, our farmers are not able to to grow it. Uh, and there's a huge uh, economic opportunity here, especially in a time like this where we have uh, a hurting economy um, and where our farmers, and our, our, in particular our small farms, are suffering. Uh, people are unemployed, etc. cetera. So um, what we've worked over the years doing is educating is lobbying, getting the laws changed, getting you know bad laws removed and, and good laws put in place, uh, and we've done a lot of media outreach, uh, events like this, working with uh, um, you know, websites and online blogs and, and newspapers and magazines. Um, so really, Hemp History Week sort of encompasses all of that. It, it really it, it, it's a it's a nice example of, of uh, an activity that we you know that that, it, that really covers everything that we do. Um, so what we've done, it, this started last year, uh, and it's, it's, it's a week-long process, but in reality, we, it, it, you know, it plays out over the, the course of a month. Um, some, some, we do a lot of events in stores uh, where you can go buy hemp products, in particular a lot of food stores, and you know, that might last the entire month of May. Are there any national uh, change that you could mention? Sure, um. yep. The, the, probably the, the most well-known one, at least here in the Northeast, would be, would be Whole Foods Market, uh, which is one of the largest natural retailers in the country, um, we are doing events at almost every, every Whole Foods store uh, in the country. Uh, in Massachusetts, I believe there's maybe 13, 12 or 13 stores. There are none here in Vermont. Um, so what we've done also, of course, is worked with a lot of, of co-ops. And so here in Brattleboro, we have the, the Brattleboro Co-op, and they're doing events uh, throughout the, the month of May. And these things include uh, tasting, product tastings, samplings. Um, there'll be literature and information. Some events have people like, you know, you and I last year were, were outside mm -hmm. the Brattleboro Co-op mm -hmm. tabling, uh, so stuff like that. <coughs> um, but, but at a minimum, it's at, least, it's at least a way to get into the store, pick up some literature, try some products, uh, you know, and, 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 and learn. Um, so what we've also done this year is, is we've gotten 
uh, uh, folks to endorse this uh, and promote it through their own networks, various celebrities. Um, uh, we've we've um, got people putting on events all around the country. Uh, any, again, not only in the stores, but in, in people's homes. You know, might do a, a, a showing of a movie, Hemp for Victory, Hemp and the Rule of Law, Standing Silent Nation. Um, just a way to, again, get the word out, get, get people, you know, knowledgeable about this and, and get them uh, active. Um, now, a big part of this whole campaign is also uh, outreach to our legislators in particular, starting with last year. Um, and, and continuing this year is a campaign to contact uh, President Obama and Attorney General Holder uh, to try to convince them to let, let hemp be grown in this country. Um, the Attorney General obviously uh, uh, reached out to the, the medical community about a year, year and a half ago with a letter stating that it was not going to be uh, the D Department of Justice policy to um, to, to bother, essentially, um, medical marijuana dispensaries in states where they've been legalized. So, Which we now know they did not live up to. So. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, it, right. It, 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 but, but, but they've certainly not been uh, bothering them as much as they probably could right. or, or many of them, I'm sure, right. would like I, to. I, I think the DEA does it as often as they can get away with it. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so it's still happening, but, but, but it's, it's been... It's been much less than it probably would be otherwise. Right. What, you know, what we're sort of pushing for is that same, that same uh, message to be sent from the top down through the ranks right. uh, among the enforcement community, et cetera, to basically, you know, for states, uh, there are a handful of states that have actually legalized hemp, but no one has grown it yet. And we've talk, we talked about this on the last show right. because uh, of those states that have legalized it, only a few have actually, actually only one have, has actually put regulations into place, that's North Dakota, and, but, but there's still this conflict with federal law. So no farmer really wants to put a hemp seed in the ground, even if he has a state permit, knowing that the federal government might swoop in and, and literally seize the farm. So what we'd like to do is get that top-down message saying, you know, for those states who are, are pursuing this and have decided to, to let it happen, let them do their thing. Let them make the decision about how to control it, how to enforce it, how to regulate it, et cetera. So, so anyway, Hemp History Week is, is all about, you know, educating yourself on hemp, maybe getting active, taking some, some action, writing a letter, sending an email, making a phone call, and it's about learning and, and educating yourself and, and helping support the hemp industry through, through uh, purchasing products and spreading the word. Now, this is the second uh, annual uh, hemp History Week, right? Now, th the first one, um, do, off the top of your head, do you have any uh, st statistics that you would say that last year we were able to uh, achieve this with the, is there Is there something you could tell our viewers about that? We, yeah, so, so one big part of the campaign <laughs> is, is uh, a postcard, which a lot of the events will have to hand out. Fill out your name and address. It's got a pre-written statement on it. Now that's what we did last year. That's what we did last oh, year. We're doing that this year. Doing also? Doing a similar thing this year. Okay. And, and that and that uh, that message is also on our website, so you can right. physically fill this out and mail it in, um, <coughs> either directly to the Department of Justice or uh, you can leave them with the event organizers wherever you might pick one up, and then they'll collect them and they send them in. We right. we actually, uh, I mean, a whole bunch were mailed in directly last year, but we also collected. Uh, over 10,000 ourselves and, and then delivered those in one, you know, uh, ceremonious uh, drop-off to the Department of Justice. So Did you feel that you had a uh, reception for that? I mean, what, what, you know, was it, could oh, you no, get a sense of anything from the Justice Department about that? Simple answer, no, no, they, there was, there was no, <laughs> so there was no for, formal, uh, no formal <laughs> response, there was uh, no thank you or, or, you know, I mean, they accepted them and right. who knows uh, right. what they did with them and um, right. yeah, they all said the same thing. It's, I mean, they were, it was, you know, again, right. it was just, it was, right. you know, right. tens of thousands of postcards, but, you know, I think, I think we, we had printed up a uh, hundred thousand postcards and of course it's impossible for us to know exactly how many actually got right. sent because a lot of people are, are sending these out directly exactly. themselves. Exactly. But, but we know for a fact mm -hmm. that we, we personally hand-delivered uh, close to 20,000 uh, postcards, I believe. So That's actually a pretty, pretty good number. 
<coughs> considering it, it's, it was the first time that that that, right. that uh, Votemp did this. Right. And, and we had a we had about a hundred and uh, I think it was twenty events last year. Uh, not sure of the exact number, but it was it was well over a hundred. And this year, I think we're looking at 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 least double that. So. Um, and now for media, uh, you know, we have shows like this and things like that. What about, uh, I is there any national coverage that we're getting on this uh, as opposed to strictly local like, like our show? Yeah, there's, there hasn't been a whole lot uh, yet. Uh, hopefully as, as the event actually kicks off, we're going to see that. And we certainly will be working that. We have a, uh, a PR firm we work with in Washington, D.C., uh, who over the years has gotten us stories uh, written in major publications, uh, USA Today, Wall Street Journal, New York Times. I mean, pretty much every major newspaper has, has covered this topic at, at some point, um, in part because of the outreach that, that we've done to the media. So we'll see. We'll see how it, how it plays out this year. But, uh, you know, a lot of support in local newspapers, you know, supporting the events going on or mentioning them, et cetera. But, but uh, so far, um, you know, we'll, we're working on the big, the big guys. You know, um, I think it might be a good time also just to remind viewers, can you explain to uh, our audience the difference again between marijuana and hemp? Sure. Um, and would you agree that there, there is some misconception about what the two plants actually do? We know they're related. Can, mm -hmm. Could you fill us in on that? Sure. The, 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 simple, the sim simplest way to explain it, I think, is to take another, uh, another species and let, let's, take the, let's take the canine species. So the, we'll, we'll go to animals here. But, but um, hemp and marijuana are the same species of plant, just like uh, a German Shepherd and a Poodle are both dogs, but they're different varieties or breeds of that species. So uh, the hemp and marijuana plants, both cannabis sativa or cannabis indica, um, but bred over thousands of years for different uses and different qualities, and over the course of time, that has created these very distinct varieties. So in a general sense, you have the, the drug varieties or the psychoactive varieties, which would be marijuana for you know, medical, recreational, spiritual use. And then on the other side, you have the, the industrial or agricultural varieties, which, uh, which would be hemp. And that, that variety has very little of the psychoactive substance, uh, THC. Marijuana has more of that. Um, and, and it's interesting because the, there, there are a whole bunch of can, what are called cannabinoids, and THC is one of them. But the other, uh, uh, CBD, uh, is, is another cannabinoid that, that is in you know, a larger quantity of, of, of all the cannabinoids. It's one of the, uh, along with THC, one that's, that's more prevalent. And it, it, it's been called the anti-THC because it actually affects, it, it, it almost removes the psychoactive effect of THC. So, um, so, so marijuana that would have high THC and low CBD, hemp on the other hand has a, a relatively higher CBD and lower THC. CBD has potential as, uh, for, for medical applications as well, interestingly enough. It's not, not just the psychoactive THC but CBD, non-psychoactive, and other non-psychoactive cannabinoids have, you know, huge potential for medical applications as well. So, 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 you know, the plants look similar if you looked at a single plant, but the way they're planted is extremely different. Uh, hemp is hemp, hemp, hemp is, is planted extremely densely, grows very tall. <coughs> you, you know, you would have trouble walking through a hemp field. I mean, literally, would would be hard to get through it. There, are, there aren't they like uh, stalks, and and they and they and they really sort of uh, grow up lengthwise this way. Mm -hmm. And is it true that the marijuana plant uh, is spaced out farther and, and gets wider birth, from which we right. get the leaves and the buds that 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 uh, that everyone loves so much. Um, and um, that, that's right. And is it true then that if jumping back to the history of hemp? that as long as 10,000 years ago, archaeology has really just found uh, hemp uh, fibers mm -hmm. in you know, the different societies from as long as 10,000 mm -hmm. years ago, um, there's evidence of use that goes back that far. Right. Uh, and <clears throat> but you know what's what I what I don't know is if if since these are all you know cannabis uh, you know 
uh, you know, a family of uh, plants. I don't know if you can say the same thing about marijuana, for instance. Um, the fiber part of uh, the, the hemp tree, it makes sense to have that because you make things uh, like that. Uh, you make things like rope and different things and sails, which would have been very useful back, uh, you know, d even 50 years ago. Because mm -hmm. as you know, they had hemp victory, um, hemp for victory, you know, during the war. So they, right. they reverted back to using hemp right. uh, for a couple years because the World War II was on. Um, and uh, do you, have you ever discovered any history about societies using marijuana, just out of curiosity? <clears throat> uh, I, I, th I think the, the, the psychoactive uses go, go back probably as far. It's hard to tell. I mean, when you, you, know, you mentioned the 10,000 years, uh, 10,000 year number. Uh, I, I think the earliest discovery of hemp was 10,000 years ago or so in China. Uh, but it's hard to tell, you know, it, when you're uncovering this, the, the remnants of the fiber or the seeds, it's hard to tell what exactly they were necessarily using it for. But I think if you look into literature and, and writings and whatnot, you'll see that, it, you know, it was, it was used, I think, both industrially for, as you mentioned, ropes and sails and, and clothing and um, all the fiber uses, as well as its oil and seed for, for food and nutrition. In fact, China has been eating the seed for probably that long as well. Right. Uh, but 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 as well, the 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 Greeks, the Chinese, are, were known to, you know, throw throw hemp plants on or marijuana plants, cannabis plants, right. on on the fire and right. during some of their ceremonies, et cetera. Right. Now I, right. I can only imagine one reason why they would have done that. Right. You know, for the burning of the. And it probably was uh, marijuana, uh, unlike hemp, was probably introduced to uh, societies through perhaps a shaman or something like that, that mm -hmm. and, and that's where it might have gained some, some traction. Because the truth is you, you either have to eat marijuana or you have to burn it in order to uh, sustain any of, the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, of whatever it is that, that you may get out of that. Mm -hmm. um, and there, so the practicality of it wouldn't have been as good as you would find with hemp which is very practical, very useful, mm -hmm. and in some ca and, and in fact, um, I, and you can confirm this, isn't hemp really like such a dynamic part of human history that if you subtracted hemp from the history, I mean, how would we make vital things, uh, sales for, for, you know, for, you know, you know uh, circumnavigation, for, you know, clothing and things like that? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to imply that, that wherever hemp may have been used for the clothing, the fiber, the sails, rope, the, the, you, there wouldn't have been something else in, in its place. And, and obviously one very common uh, is flax, linen. Um, so, so plenty of clothing and, and ropes and similar items. Were is that were part of the biomass family that, that we taught, that I hear? You know, yeah, uh, yes it is, yeah. So, so, you know, linen, I mean, that's a fairly common clothing material. Right. Uh, I mean, it's a niche material like like hemp, but but it's but it's common. You can go find a pair of linen pants, a, you know, linen suit, et cetera. It, it's it's you know, but but there are various reasons why hemp is probably better than any of the other biomass uh, fiber crops. And and to name some of the main ones, you've got uh, canaf, you've got jute, you've got sisal. These are all crops that, like hemp, produce. Uh, a large amount of biomass and, and, and good fiber of various uh, lengths and qualities. Is bamboo in that group? Um, bamboo would be different, but, but it's certainly, it, it, it's more of a, uh, you know, hemp has, <laughs> hemp has these long fibers on the outside, and then it has what's called the, 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 the woody, a woody core, the herds. And, you know, when you, you dry the plant, when, as it's processed, you dry the plant, Back in the day, before this was mechanized, you would you would thrash it. You would you would literally take it and throw it over this this comb. You, actually, first you would take a breaker and you would break that that break it up, loosen it up the stalk, and then you would take and you throw it over a, a comb and 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 pull it through to start pulling the fi the long fibers out and separating them from the herds. That's the biggest component of processing the hemp stalk is to separate those long fibers from the inner uh, sh you know shorter fibers that that would be more of a this, this, you know, herd. Um, that's a that's a good graphic picture. Um, I, I think that that's really important for people to know that it's that the that the fibers are on the outside of the stalk, and <clears throat> that's why they're so readily accessible. Mm -hmm. uh, and so now the inner core. What is is that? I mean, you could use that for lumber and other things, can't you? And uh, yeah, exactly. The 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 uh, the herds uh, are used on you know sort of the low end. Uh, 
not so glorious uh, products like like animal bedding. Um, so in place of, of wood shavings, for example, for your you know your your pet rabbit or your guinea pig or uh -huh. or horses even it's actually uh, quite popular for horses because it has much lower uh, dust. Uh, it is it is more absorbent. Um, it's more sustainable. So you know it's it's uh, it's actually becoming quite popular for that purpose. But then you can take that same product and you can mix it with lime or mortar and make a a cement type building product which can be poured into a mold like a foundation would be poured or it can be sprayed onto a structure like uh, think about you know a gunite uh, swimming pool you know where they that's a cement product and they're they're just spraying it so so a huge you know flexibility with the application of this but bottom line it hardens uh, almost as hard as rock yet it's still light it it actually breathes so the structure that you're you're living in naturally is letting moisture in and out of it which is which is how you avoid mold and mildew problems. Um, it's, it's got a, an R factor of roughly two per inch. So if you do a 16 inch wall, you, all you need to do is put stucco on the outside and plaster on the inside. And then you have your, your lime and your hemp uh, herds and it's got an R, an R value of, of about 32. Um, an R would, value means resistance or what is it? What's uh, an R value is a way to, uh, to measure the insulating quality of a, of a, of a you know, a substance, oh, so whether wood or, or you know, <clears throat> fiberglass, you know, pink fiberglass insulation, et cetera. You know, most houses, you know, ideally you want something up, up in, in the 30 to 40 range, and, and hemp can achieve that with a wall that's 16 or so inches thick. Um, but, but no, you know, you don't need the insulation, so you don't need to then add the insulation, the drywall, the, you know, the, most, most homes these days, the standard building technology is, is, is five to seven different layers when you start with your stick frame, and, and work out to your final finished wall. It's five to seven layers of products. When, when you build out of hemp, hempcrete is, is sort of the generic term for this. Um, all you need is that, that hemp, hemp herds mixed with the, the lime, the mortar, and then like I said, a stucco on the outside and a, a plaster on the inside. The thing, you know, sort of an adobe style, you know, rammed earth or mud. Would the strength um, be uh, similar to the, the seven layers you were describing the other way? I mean, it, it, cause it, well, it's not necessarily a structural building product. I mean, uh, there, there are different ways you can in engineer what you're building it around, and you can, you can actually use it on floors and, and <coughs> roofs, but, but it's primarily used, at least today, in, in, in walls. Um, if those walls are going to be load bearing, then you do need a structure within the hemp that you're. you're pouring it around. It's in and of itself, it's not something that has a high load-bearing uh, capability. But, but it just, you know, it, it, these, these homes, and they've, they've started actually building them here in, in the United States. Uh, I mean, this has been happening now, you know, for, well, for probably thousands of years in, in Europe and, and other parts of the world. But, right, but, they, but we've just, right. just recently sort of discovered this in the U.S., and uh, there's a company uh, called Hemp, uh, Hemp Technologies that is importing some of these products. And that's, that's that's the crazy thing about this is we have to import these. Of course, the idea is we should be growing these here, um, but but the they've built a couple houses down in North Carolina, and they are uh, a lot of a lot of research has been done by the company that supplies them in England, and these houses are are not just carbon neutral; they're carbon negative. They actually that house has more carbon, you know, contained in it, being sequestered in it than you used to build the house, to, to grow the crop and process it and the energy that goes into the house, et cetera. So it, it's actually a very exciting area for hemp, I mean, building materials. Um, so, so there's that, there's, there's a particle board, you, 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 know, you mentioned um, uh, you know, wood, but you, just like you could take a, a uh, wood chips or sawdust or other fibers and make uh, you know, MDF board or plywood, right. um, those are not solid wood, they're all composites, they're all made out of either slices of wood or, or sawdust, and then you're just mixing it with a, a composite and you're forming it into this four by eight sheet of, of uh, building material. You can do that same exact thing with, with hemp herds. So then, <clears throat> it, it, it seems to me that um, this country has a just incredible lost opportunity here that, that um, that we're not uh, we're not in line with other countries like China and uh, and I think Canada and other countries that actually export hemp to us mm -hmm. so that then we can <clears throat> if we should choose use for all of these different products and stuff and <clears throat> we're not are we going to 
do you think we'll ever catch up with countries like, I mean, it's hard to imagine that. I mean, if you look at the United States, we have a vast, um, in fact, upstate <coughs> Vermont, for instance, we have a depressed dairy industry. And so what happens is, and elsewhere in the country, and, and, and so you have unused large tracts of land that would have been used for grazing, say, but aren't necessarily anymore, that could easily be used for just vast uh, tracts of hemp forest in this country that we could take loggers and it would create huge job opportunities because um, our, uh, our uh, country doesn't do that. We're not employing people that way. And here we are, we're talking about um, having job losses and, uh, and an economic downturn and mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, is it, is, it, it, does, do the legislators really have to just <laughs> connect it to marijuana so intensely that they want to outlaw it? I mean, is the DEA really that so overwhelmed with uh, missed um, chemical signatures and things that they think that hemp uh, growth is, is, you know, should be uh, outlawed because of its, uh, its um, uh, f family connection to marijuana. There's something very wrong about that. And uh, so part of what we hope to, to bring to Vermont is to, is, is uh, as much information about this as we can so that you folks can have a, a better idea of what hemp is, what it does, and how can we get it, um, and how can we get this information before the legislature so that they can overturn the laws and begin making uh, farmer, allowing farmers in our state to grow hemp. Um, if we were to, is, is there any, is there, are, are there any key things, any key contacts, for instance, in Vermont that you would uh, recommend our viewers would you you know in the legislature ha you know what if, if someone wanted to speak out like, about this wh what would they do where would they go well I, I think um, we, we, we could do a whole show on, on, on this topic of how, how to reach out and and how to how to get active um, I think the first place I would send them really is our is our website uh, votehemp.com because we have tools that are there to make it easy uh, for you to take take action. Uh, it doesn't take a lot and, and a lot of people say, you know, my, you know, my voice isn't going to make a difference, my opinion is not going to make a difference, <laughs> but, uh, you know, you, it, it does and it, and it all adds up. So go to Vote Hemp, go to our, our Get Active section, um, take action, uh, it's called, and, and, and explore that because it makes it easy to write both your, your, uh, your, your state, well, actually it's, it's more geared towards the federal side, um, but the you know, it, it allows you to look up all of your, your legislators and uh, all their contact information. We give uh, sample letters to write. You can, you can, you know, cut and paste. You can use our system with a pre-written letter. So there's all, way, all sorts of ways. But, but that, that's the main thing. Just, just find, you know, contact, you know, your two senators. Find out who your rep is. In this state, of course, there's only one, uh, Welsh and, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders uh, and Patrick Leahy, uh, two senators. You know, call their offices, write them, email them. And then from the state level, same thing. Find out who your local representative is. Call the governor. I mean, luckily our governor is actually, uh, you know, a proponent of this this, uh, this right. issue. That's and, right. And uh, you know, we have a law here where we've legalized uh, hemp in Vermont in 2008. Uh, the law started in 07. It was it was passed over to 2008, and it was it was passed, and it became Act 212. Um, and hemp is legal. They just haven't put the rules into place to regulate it. And that's really what, what we should be putting pressure on now is, is to, you know, let's, let's get these rules in place and, and you know, let's, let's get moving on this. Well, Eric Lineback, once again, you've really brought us a lot of important information uh, for this show. And we hope that, that our viewers learn something from this and that it, it really does uh, help you to, to take action. Um, this, this is meant to be informative, and we thank you for listening, uh, Eric. Um, I'm glad you could come back again, and we would like to have you on again. So on behalf of Marijuana Resolve, Daryl Pillsbury, uh, myself and Joe Bushy in the control booth, uh, and Paul Bennett in New York City, and BCTV Studios, thank you very much for listening, and we'll be bringing you more information about marijuana and hemp 
uh, in 2011. Thank you.